I've recently been having quite a few conversations with people about the ethics behind some of the shots that you get when you're filming wildlife, how close is too close and those sorts of things. So I thought I would go through a sequence that I filmed and edited for last year's summer highlights video for Safe for Med and talk a little bit about the ethics behind each shot. Uh, if you haven't seen the full video, I'll put the link down below so that you can watch that. Uh, and if not, we'll just dive straight into it. The first shot um, is this dolphin jumping. And <laughs> this was actually, uh, this is a Mediterranean striped dolphin. And it's actually bow riding in front of a large cargo ship that was moving through the area that we were working in out in deep water. And we spent a few minutes with the dolphins around our boat. And then we noticed the, dof the dolphins heading over to this cargo ship. And so we basically just went parallel to the ship, watching them jumping, bow riding for probably 15 minutes in front of the, uh, the tanker. So it didn't have to get too close for that one. Just had to keep shooting and uh, wait for them to, to keep jumping. Uh, this turtle was actually not filmed by me, filmed by my colleague Sophie. And uh, the full clip is basically her uh, getting relatively close to the animal and then letting the animal come close to her. And um, this was a very curious turtle and uh, spent several minutes uh, investigating her GoPro. A lot of people think that's me. It's not. It's my colleague Augusti. I'm filming it. I'll come back to the mantas a little bit later on. And I'll come back to the tuna as well. Okay, this is a bottlenose dolphin. Um, you can see the conditions are really flat on that day. And we basically found that there was a speed that was kind of like your ideal, your optimum speed for getting dolphins to come and interact. Um, bottlenose dolphins in the Mediterranean are quite hit and miss in terms of whether they want to interact or not. Uh, getting footage of them underwater is incredibly difficult and we've tried several different techniques to try and do it and none of them have worked. So this is me leaning over the side of the boat with the camera um, as low as I dare, which helps when the conditions are this smooth. And uh, waiting for them to come close enough to bow ride and I'm doing this um, at super slow motion so that I make sure I can get a nice long sequence, a long shot out of one single jump. Um, so in terms of ethics, this was basically allowing the dolphins to be as interactive with us as they wanted to be and then not pushing it. Once we noticed that they were getting either bored or losing interest, we don't keep following them. We stay on our trajectory, on our path, and then give them a little bit of space. And then, then if they come back to us, then we'll continue working with them and continue filming them. Um, but what we try and avoid is chasing dolphins because they'll just dive straight away and then you lose your opportunities for any more filming. So on this particular occasion, this was early on in, the, uh, in their interaction with us. So we were able to stay with them for several minutes and that's when they were bow riding in front of our rib like this. Uh, this is my friend Nick at the top of a barracuda spiral. This is in a marine protected area called El Toro. And uh, they're pretty relaxed around divers, as you can see, as the diver is also pretty relaxed around them. And uh, yeah, just very easy to get very close to and, and they'll kind of give you a look and, and nothing else. The sperm whale I'll come back to. Again, another example of a bow riding dolphin. This is um, my colleague Mary with a power lens in her hand. Again, the same situation, going as fast as we uh, feel is appropriate for the speed that they're going and letting them interact with us in whatever way they want. That's a slipper lobster. Okay, this is the bluefin tuna where we spent probably in this on this occasion about 20 minutes in the water with them. Um, the ethics behind this, no one really has gotten in the water with wild tuna all that often. It's a bit of an unknown. So we have a little uh, tactic, a technique, which is basically head towards where we've last seen them jumping, get in the water as quickly as possible, negative entry, go down to about five, six meters and just wait. Sometimes they then circle around you like they're doing here. And sometimes they'll be gone before you've gotten in the water because they are that fast. 
They spend several minutes being curious and then gradually they lose interest. And as I say, I think this occasion was about 20 minutes. And so uh, we let them kind of show their curiosity. They'll go round and round and round and then disappear. So again, we're not chasing the animal. Um, we're staying very static and letting them be in charge of how long they uh, interact with us. Uh, this is a swordfish, which we spotted on an expedition. And I'm actually in the water at this moment. This is a drone shot filmed by my colleague Agasti. And um, we were getting closer and closer to the animal, but quite cautiously, because it was quite strange to see a swordfish swimming at the surface in this way. And it did so for about 40 minutes, um, which is how we were able to get this drone footage. Um, but yeah, we were being very, very cautious in the water. Uh, if this animal was sick or felt threatened in any way, um, this is not an animal that you want to make annoyed. Um, so we didn't get anywhere near it to film underwater because we didn't want to get too close to it. But that's how we got this drone shot. Okay, the mantas. Um, we spent four days, five days in a row with the mantas underwater last summer. And um, it was very much a case of trial and error to begin with. The first day I was the only person that went down on scuba for the first 10 minutes and everyone stayed on the surface and they came and uh, were very curious with me. But um, we had other objectives of the day, so there were other people going up and down as well uh, later on and we found they then kind of maybe got less interested. Um, so on this occasion we were again trying to make ourselves a focal point so that they could come straight to us, they could decide how long they wanted to spend with us. There's no way you're going to be able to keep up with a manta swimming away. Um, I'm calling them mantas because that's the name in Spanish. In English, these are spine-tailed devil rays, or mobula mobula for the scientific among you. And uh, this is an animal that is very curious, they're very, intellig very intelligent. You can see them looking at you as they swim past. But the length of the encounter is very much up to them. And uh, we could only get as much footage as they would allow. Uh, once they had kind of decided they figured us out, then they disappeared and we didn't see them anymore. I remember this dive quite well. Uh, I basically hung out with this exact grouper. This is a dusky grouper, which I named Scarlet. And she was, uh, he in fact, we <laughs> later found out, uh, was incredibly curious and came remarkably close to my camera, more so than any of the other groupers. So I stayed with him for an extra sort of 20 minutes um, and just allowed him to keep coming round and round and round and round um, to get as many shots of him as I, as I possibly could and this is one of the best ones. Uh, these are Rizzo's dolphins filmed on the drone. Um, we try and be a bit careful when um, we're filming cetaceans with a drone low to the waterline. Um, there were a few occasions when a few individuals kind of turned their heads and looked up into the sky to see what was going on. Um, there are a few studies based around how much drones might affect cetacean behaviour. So we were limiting the time, well I was limiting the time of how low the drone was as much as possible. In fact this was the only low shot that I got, all the others were from much higher up so that you could see a bigger context of where the animals were in the water. And then we had topside video going on as well. Um, so yeah, they definitely reacted to the drone. Um, whether it was just curious or whether they felt a bit threatened, I'm not 100% sure. Um, so we were limit trying to limit the time that we spent with the drone low to the ground, uh, low to the waterline. This was probably one of the most challenging ethical battles in my mind so far and that is uh, when you come across a turtle that's entangled in here what is a ghost fad um, that animal's probably been out there for several hours if not several days and your initial response and reaction mine certainly was is to try and rescue that animal as quickly as possible which of course we always try and do the reality is if you spend an extra three or four minutes um, getting into the water with that animal while it's entangled and getting a really good shot, photo, whatever of that animal in its situation, that 
can have huge benefits for the population in terms of raising awareness, spreading education, and, uh, and, and trying to um, change how, uh, the, the, way that we use, the way that ghost fads are floating around the ocean. Um, it's a real ethical battle the first time, at least it was for me, where you're in the water with an animal that's, that's clearly uh, in distress, and the first thing you do is film it. Um, but I think long term and for the species, it's beneficial to get that image um, because it can do a lot of help for the, for the species. Obviously, if that animal was literally at death's door and not able to keep its head above the water, then that would be slightly different. But when it's still got a lot of fight in it and it's still moving around um, quite a lot, which these ones are, um, it's, it's actually really worth it to get the image to be able to use it for education purposes and raising awareness. Uh, this is probably my best underwater dolphin shot and it's done by just holding the camera under the water by the side of the boat. As I said earlier, all underwater techniques of trying to get in the water with the dolphins here doesn't work. And so, um, yeah, I, I've created the technique of just dipping the camera in as far as my arms will go and see if they come over, and this one did. Okay, the sperm whales. Um, it takes a long time to find a sperm whale, that's the first thing to say. This particular one, this is a male that I filmed in September last year. It took us three days to find him. A further three hours of visual tracking. Um, we then uh, were with him on the water for maybe six or seven minutes and I was in the water with him for less than 30 seconds. And I got about 15 seconds of footage. Um, so being able to be there as quickly as possible is pretty key. These animals spend about 10 minutes at the surface before an hour of foraging for food down in the depths. Um, with the sperm whales, again, not an animal that you want to get on the wrong side of. Um, there are permits in place, which we have, to be able to get close to them. Um, there are things that are really, really important. For example, not approaching them from head on, always approaching from the boat from behind, not getting too close. Um, being aware of the signals that the animal is giving you. If it's relaxed, you can tell a lot by how it's breathing. If there's lots of breaths, then the animal is getting stressed. And then when you're actually in the water, um, you're not going to be able to keep up with this animal anyway, but not trying to swim after it um, because it will just keep ahead of you and there's no way you'll get anywhere near it. And uh, yeah, managed to get a few seconds of footage of this whale before he then dove down and we didn't see him again for the rest of the day. This is actually a different whale, which was uh, a few months earlier. Now, this whole sequence is the bait ball action of El Toro, which happens at the end of summer each year. Uh, that's a 24 meter deep bait ball. Uh, the ethics of this one is get as close as you can to the bait ball and wait for the predators to come through. Okay, um, this one makes me nervous when I see divers around it, um, almost to the point where you don't really want to tell them that it's there. Um, on this particular occasion, I spent probably uh, 45 minutes with this animal. Um, it was only at a depth of about 12 meters, so I could, I could have quite a long dive time there. And there were several dive groups coming through. And when that happened, I would get right out of the way because um, new divers kicking all the um, algae and everything is not good for the animal, of course. Um, and then when the groups would leave, I would uh, then spend a bit of time with them, sometimes filming, sometimes not. Um, I don't think I used, no, I didn't use lights on this shot, but occasionally I turn my lights on, but being really careful to make sure that I'm not leaving the lights on for very long and certainly not at their maximum brightness because that can um, disrupt the animal, disturb the animal. 
Um, seahorses are very delicate creatures, as you, as you can imagine. Um, so with this one, it was more just trying to give him his space and um, allow him to move around the algae and uh, just kind of be in the areas that he's moving into without um, disrupting him too much. And uh, yeah, I got a few nice shots like this one um, of him doing that. Okay, so there you go. That's a breakdown of some of the ethics behind the shots um, that we got, or that I got last summer for Save the Med. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Hopefully that's helpful. And uh, again, check out the full video down below um, to see how it all looks as a sequence. Cheers.